All right, good evening. Good to have everybody tonight. And uh, we're going to continue our study on the uh, armor of God. And uh, just, just so everybody knows, next week we won't be having class because of the, uh, the crusade with Frank Shelton uh, over uh, in front of Crossroads Church. So we'll be there next Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, so we won't have anything here. And as you know, we've had different speakers that have been sharing and, and talking about uh, uh, the, the armor of God and kind of different aspects of it. And tonight we're going to talk about the shield of faith. And we are uh, really privileged to have Jackie Calloway here. And uh, Jackie is going to be sharing with us tonight on, on the shield of faith. But her and her family uh, have a produce farm and uh, where they grow watermelon, corn, cantaloupe, and sometimes tomatoes and a few other things. But they have a, have a large farm operation that kind of consumes their lives from, uh, from May till just about late September. And so, uh, so we, we were talking this summer. She said, really, you know, I'd like to share some night on Wednesday, some Wednesday night. And uh, we were talking about the armor of God. And I said, what, what interests you? She said, you know, the shield of faith. And so tonight she's going to share with us on the shield of faith. So I just want to encourage you to just open your heart as she comes and, and just opens a word to us tonight. So let's welcome Jackie. It did kind of sort of go like that. We were talking about Bible study, and I thought it would be kind of neat. I had seen a couple of different Bible studies that maybe for him to do, and then he had said that they were going to be doing this Bible study um, with some different speakers. And when he mentioned that um, you guys were doing the armor of God, is that really loud? Is it okay? Okay. Um, then I got excited because I had done a personal study um, by um, Priscilla Shire, Last summer, when, like he said, in the summer we are consumed with the farm and aren't able to come to church seven days a week. And so I work from home, pretty much don't go anywhere. I'm in the office every night at 4 o'clock from 4 p.m. to like 9 or 10 at night. So um, during the day when the orders are coming and I have some time and I'll do a Bible study to try to keep myself connected um, as best I can. You got that ringing, Mike? You hear it? Okay. That's okay. Um so when he said you were doing the armor of God, then I got excited because I'd already done this Bible study last summer, and I knew that there was something in it that had intrigued me, that it kind of like really stood out, and I really wasn't sure what it was. So he said, well, see which one you want to do and get back to me. So I was praying about it and trying to think and busy. I wasn't able to go and look. I thought I'll just go back and look through the book. So one morning I woke up. It was about 2 o'clock in the morning, and I woke up, and I'm like, the shield of faith. And I really didn't know why. I was just like, I think it's shield of faith. So um, later in the day, I went and I grabbed my book, and I started to look through it. On the very first page of the, of the thing I had written, page 135, was pivotal to me. And I don't even use the word pivotal, so I don't even know where that came from. And I was like, okay, cool. So it wasn't page 135. So I turned to that, and it was in the shield of faith. So I was like, okay. And then, and then I started to get excited because I remembered in this study, which a lot of what I'm going to share with you came from this study, um, why it intrigued me so much and why it got me so excited. So before we start, let's go ahead and um, pray that God will just bless us tonight. Heavenly Father, we just come before you and we thank you, Lord, for this day. God, we thank you that you have equipped us to take what comes our way, to take, Lord, what you are trying to give us. And God, you have given us the tools to combat against the enemy and what he's trying to give us, Father. God, help us to know the difference. Help us to be discerning. Help us to have wisdom. And God, tonight I just pray, Lord, that something that is said in the study will stick with them as it did with me, Father, in my walk with you. And as we all continue to just seek you and to know you more. In your name we pray. Amen. So we know in James chapter 2, 20, he says, faith without works is dead. So faith is not just a, faith is such an ominous word. It's just kind of. You could define it in so many different ways, but faith without works is dead. Faith is a call to action. In the armor of God, the first three are things that you put on, the shoes of peace, the breastplate of righteousness. The next three, when you're starting to take up, the Bible says, take up your shield of faith. And we're going to read that. I know you probably read it every week. I'm not sure. Um, but in any event, I thought I had it. Can I do it? Can I? I got it here. 
And just so you know, I've not done this, not taught like this. I do sing on the worship team, and sometimes God will give me something to say, but I know for a fact that's all him because we will sing and then he'll start speaking, but <laughs> this is a little different, so just bear with me. I appreciate your patience. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, this is where the action comes in, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all of the Lord's people. So he's calling us to do something. And... um, Faith is, faith is when you act like God is telling the truth. So you just think about that a second. Somebody can tell you. Faith is when we act like Pastor Ken is telling the truth. We have faith in his word and in his study. And God is so much larger. Faith is when we act like God is telling the truth. Again, it's still an action. It's not something that you can say you have without no one's going to see your faith until you put feet to your faith. There's an analogy of a chair. You see the chair, and you think it can hold you. You might be a a larger person, and you're thinking, I think that chair can hold me. You have the faith that it can hold you. Until you kind of assess the strength of the chair, you're not going to know. Until you sit in it, until you rest in it, you're not going to know. But you have to take that action of sitting in the chair to understand that what the strength of what you have the faith in, and that's how faith in God works as well. You have to get to know him more and more. You can't just stop at where you are. You can't stop at what you knew way back when. You have to continue to be in his word. His word is never changing. It continues to teach us, and we have to continue to be in it so that our faith can continue to be active, so we continue to put feet to our faith. So um, faith says more about God, what you really believe in him, and less about you. So they can say, I know that she's a person of faith. I know that he's a person of faith. What does that really mean? We have faith that the sun is going to rise every day. We have faith that the vehicle is going to start and it's going to take us to our place, our destination. Faith says less about you and more about what you really believe to be true about God. And again, it goes back to it's when that you act like God is telling the truth. When you stand on his word. The enemy is going to send things into our lives to try to distract us. The faith place is a, is stepping into a situation where you put yourself into a position for God to have to come through. A lot of times um, we'll say, I really feel like I should step out on faith and I should make this move. I really feel like I should step out on faith and who's this Bible study? Um, I, we should just step out on faith and go talk to that person or go share with that person. Um, but when you enter the faith place, You're stepping into a situation where you put yourself into a position where it's no longer you that's doing it, but God has to come through. And that's when you know. Then then you, it's always like after when you say, that really was a God thing. It wasn't just me. I think we all want to know. It's not me. I'm not just doing this because I feel like I should do it. Faith isn't your feelings. Faith is really trusting in a God who is directing our steps every day. A lot of times distractions are thrown our way insecurity, fear, doubt, intimidation. The main antagonist of faith is fear. And then I remember why I got so excited about the shield of faith. And I think hopefully you guys all picked up the, um, the picture that was back there of the, uh, the Roman soldier. And this is on um, all of the, the armor of God. But this whole study and, and everything about this, I've, I've learned and heard about this all of my life. I grew up in the church. I was, I was very blessed to have a family who went to church. And, um, 
and lived a Christian life and was taught in our home. And I didn't go to a Christian school, but it was still, it was taught in my home. And I was able to witness to friends in school and around me. And But as I continue to grow older, um, I continue to fall more and more in love with the word of God. From a child, I was told the stories. And so I kind of took them for granted that I knew what God could do. And I never doubted it. And I had faith in God that he could do those things. But now I'm falling in love more and more with the authors of his word. He called them. They didn't see him. Well, the New Testament they did, but even in the Old Testament, it just amazes me how they had a faith and they trusted a cloud. They trusted a pillar. They trusted a burning bush. They trusted things before Christ had even come to make the sacrifice, that God was God and that he created this earth, that there was a higher being than us. And so when Paul is writing on the armor of God, I think it's really kind of cool because he was writing to them on what he knew they could relate to. And the one thing that they could relate to was the armor of the Roman soldier. So in the picture, you can see there's the sword of the spirit, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the shoes of peace. And see that, that belt of truth in, in there, they're talking about how the belt of truth, they, the, the armor, the, um, the skirt of their, um, of their armor was long and they could trip up. So they would have to like take it and tuck it into their belt of truth so that their feet could move freely. And you see in the bottom right, the picture of the shoe and it's got the prong on the bottom of the shoe. And that was so they could stand firm and they could stand securely. So when Paul's saying, stand firm and stand again, they could kind of get that analogy of what the Roman soldier would do in, in wartime. The shield of faith. Their shield was wooden. It was two feet wide by four feet long. So you could hold it and they could crouch down behind it. They could hide. But on top of that, it, the wood planks were sealed together. They had canvas that was over the wooden planks. And then over top of the canvas, it was enforced with leather. And then right in the middle, there was an iron boss that would kind of fortify the strength of it, right there by where the handle would be that they were going to hold. So as they were in the war and as they were going through, they had this, and they could crouch down behind it, and it was kind of a place to be hidden. So that in itself kind of excited me, and I'm not like a war. I don't like the war movies and things like that. Um, but they said it was so large that they could crouch down and they could be, be, hit, be hidden behind it. When they would advance in the war, they would hold it in front of them. We're all in that war. We're all in the spiritual war. We have it. We have it with things we face daily in our homes, in our marriages, with our children, in our addictions, in our schools, in our churches. It's just, it's just a, it's been ongoing and it's going to be ongoing until the Lord comes back and puts his final stop to it. So we have our shield of faith and we're going to advance. And it's going to be in front of us. It's fortified. We've got an iron boss right, right in the middle where we can put our handle. And we can crouch down. But the best thing about this was what they would do with it. And they could link it. They would stand in a circular formation back to back in however many. It doesn't really specify how many people. But they could stand back to back in a circle. And when they did that, they could raise them all up overhead. And they would meet. And it would form a shell. So instead of just advancing for themselves, they're advancing for the army. They're advancing for the kingdom. And they're all standing like this, and it's called the turtle shell formation. And so then they could crouch down, and they could link their shields together and, um, and hold them overhead, that creating the, the turtle shell formation. So when missiles from the enemy came flying, they would um, be protected together as a unit. So as they're trying to advance, sometimes you got to stop. Sometimes you can't advance by yourself. Sometimes you got to find your pod. Sometimes you have to find your group, and you have to stand back to back, support each other, get that turtle shell formation, and just hold it. There's a lot of times where some um, some places they would have um, access to water because a lot of times the enemy would light the light their javelins with tar and pitch, set them on fire, and send fire. They weren't trying to kill the soldiers. They were just trying to cause a distraction. So if this pod over here was able to wet their shields first, they were going to be okay, and their shields were going to deflect it. But this pod over here wasn't prepared or didn't have the access to it. They would catch on fire, which would do what? 
it will cause a distraction. And then those who are trying to advance against the enemy, they are now distracted by the fire, by the arrows that the enemy is flying. So even sometimes when you feel you're protected, when you feel that you are under God's full protection and things are going well in your life and you're moving forward against the enemy and against things, the devil, he's so predictable. He's going to try to distract you. He's going to try to start a little fire over here, start a little fire over here. And then you're going to turn your attention from the advance and you're going to go and you're going to still trying to do a good thing and help others. It doesn't have to be a bad distraction, just a distraction. Anything that can take your mind off of following the mind of Christ and finding the mind of Christ is a distraction that the devil will use to get you on the defensive end of things and off of the offensive end of things and from advancing in the war against him. He doesn't necessarily want to kill you. He's sending fiery darts at us to distract us. We will be so busy putting out internal fires, forgetting that we were on the offensive line and advancing towards him. He is then able to advance towards us and to weaken us. He will advance against our lives while we are trying to deal with the fires that are coming at us. Sometimes we just get distracted. Social media, girlfriends, boyfriends, problems that we have. Um, sometimes we get distracted by, even like by prayer for other people and forgetting to cover our own selves in prayer. Sometimes you, you can even be advancing toward the kingdom and doing what you feel is the right thing. But if we are not putting on the full armor of God every day for ourselves, and if we are not taking up our shield of faith and walking out ourselves, then we're going to get distracted. We're not even going to be able to get back to back with our brothers and sisters. That was the thing in this um, study that did excite me because I realized it's not all about my fight against the enemy. We're all against the enemy, and I don't ever like giving him too much credit. It's just a, it's just a thing. It says it. The Bible says it. You know, he's in the heavenly realms. He's, he's up there. He's fighting. God has given him, you know, a, a certain amount of time. And uh, it's just it's a known thing that things are going to come against us. Things are going to distract us. We're going to get worried. We're Sometimes we can just be full of joy and happy and also distracted. Our prayer lives get distracted in a joyful way. But we have to be diligent in keeping our mind aligned with Christ and putting on all of the pieces of armor every day so that we are ready to go. The shoes that have those special prongs underneath, you know, when we can stand on hard, rocky spaces, we can stand in the grass, we can stand in the mud, and the Bible says stand and then stand firm again. And those, 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 um, those shoes of peace, as he refers to them, the analogy, but, um, you know, they're important. Every single piece of the armor is important. Our God does not instill fear. So we know that when we're distracted by fear, that that is coming from the enemy. Again, he's predictable in what he's going to do. He's going to know your strengths, and he's going to know your weaknesses, and he's going to come after them. And we have to be able to protect against them. No one else can do that for us. People can intercede for us. I'm sure we all have mothers and grandmothers and fathers and grandfathers and friends and people that are interceding for us. But when it comes to faith, that's, that's between you and God. Your faith does not have to be large. It just has to be rooted in who you know God to be. Your faith just has to be rooted in a good God. God doesn't say, if your faith was bigger, that I would do more. He just says, be faithful. Um, I have down here to read Luke 5, 4. Let me find it. This was the um, time when Simon was out in the boat. Simon and the guys were all out in the boat. They'd been out all night, and they weren't able to catch any fish. All night. They'd been working all night long, and they were exhausted, and they were there, and they were cleaning up the boat, and they were cleaning up their nets, and they were picking things up, and then Jesus walks up, and um, I'll just read it. So one day as Jesus was standing by the lake, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. 
he saw at the water's edge two boats left bare by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats belonging to Simon, asking him to put it out a little from shore. And then he sat down in Simon's boat, and he taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered him, Master, we've worked hard all night, and we haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish, their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came, and they filled both boats so full that they began to sink. There was a lot of this Bible study that I had done that focused just on that, because you say so, God, because you say so. And how many times do you remember your parents growing up when you say, well, why can't I have that piece of candy? And there was no real rare answer, just because I say so. <laughs> and then it's kind of like, that's it, you know, it's done, it's definitive. Um, you know, then we say, well, God, why can't I go see this movie? You know, what's wrong with this movie? Because I say so. And um, for Simon, that was enough just to be that obedient because I say so. Now, how can we know when God's saying so? When he's telling you, how do you know if it's him or if it's your own feelings? Again, we talk about feelings. Um, faith cannot be based on your feelings or his word. You take it to his word. You can test things in his word. And at the end, we'll go through the scriptures that are on um, the second page there on some things. Not everything, not like when we were talking about like a decision to move away or God, you feel like God's calling you to a different place or God's calling you to a different um, job or a different something. Um, and you, you want to be sure it's God before you go. You want to be sure you're not acting on your feelings or that it was in your own head. Um, those kinds of things, you go for godly counsel. You, you go to his word. You pray to him. You wait to hear from him. Um, you find people in the church that you trust and you take that to them. Pray about that as well. Pray, pray before you speak with someone on personal issues. Um, you know, God will direct you in, in the right direction for that. But there are a lot of things where we don't necessarily need to seek anyone else because he's made them very clear in his word. And those are all of those things that are on that second page, like I said, that we will get to um, when we're wrapping it up. So we know when we start to be distracted, with every little fire, that we aren't going to have time to act and step out on the water for ourselves, even though he tells us so. As I was studying for this, I kept focusing on the faith part of things. And um, God just kind of jumped out. He said, you're forgetting the shield, even though I had already gotten all excited about the Roman shield and how they used it in war and how we reading the Bible can get that analogy that we also have a shield of faith that we can hold out before so that we can hold together with our brothers and sisters. But without just focusing on the faith, I got redirected to the shield. And so I did a Google because I did a lot. I did a Google on acronyms for faith and we see them all the time and we've heard them, you know, I think my favorite one is fear ain't in this house. I like that. But um, shield, you guys probably know well more than I did, but it's, it's a military term. Stands for Strategic Homeland Intervention Enforcement Logistics Division. That just kind of drops right there. Strategic Homeland Intervention Enforcement Logistics Division. That's our shield of faith. We need to be strategic. How can we be strategic? In our prayer. We can be strategic in our prayer. We can be strategic in knowing God's word, growing in wisdom, seeking godly counsel. Homeland is wherever you are. It's, it's your heart. We have to protect our homeland. We have to protect our heart, our souls, our minds, um, our people, our families, our brothers, our sisters, our church, our community, our country, that's our homeland. So right now, the shield of faith is taking action. We're being strategic. We're fighting against the enemy, and we're going to fight to protect our homeland. When we do that, 
God will intervene on our behalf, and we will have his intervention. When we go actively in our faith, God will intervene on your behalf, and you'll see it. You'll see things move. You'll see mountains move. Sometimes you may not know at the time what he's doing. Sometimes he'll change your circumstances, and then you'll say, hmm, you'll kind of look back. For me, it's always a look back, 2020, you know, vision, hindsight, 2020. Um, like, yeah, he was, he was there all the time. Again, you might not feel it, but faith isn't about feeling. We're not in our feelings for this. Our feelings change. God's word never changes. His protection never changes. Our faith cannot be based on feelings. It has to be rooted in the good God that we know that he is. And we can continue to grow that faith when we continue to get in his word and understand the people that they were just people like you and I. I heard um, Lee Thompson say that one time when Miss Joyce was coming out of her back surgery. And he was like, if she wrote a book, it would be the book of Joyce. And um, because God has moved so powerfully in her life. But honestly, we all have a book. We all, we, it's the, the book of Tim, the book of Dave. We, we all have a book to write. And God's not changing his word. He's not editing it. He's not updating it for the times. He's not updating it, changing his laws, changing the things that he said. His word is firm and secure. And I think if there's anything that we can take faith in, it is the fact that he is an unchanging God, and his word is firm and secure and unwavering. And if we have a question, we can take it to the word and we can find an answer from him. So we've got strategic homeland intervention enforcement. I already got there. It's God's word. Take your questions to God's word and he will enforce his answers. Pastor Tim talked about our farm. Um, the next is L in shield for logistics. Uh, my job is to, I don't go out in the fields and do the physical labor. I did when I was younger and before we had kids and stuff, although I don't think anybody in my family gives me credit for that. They don't remember. <laughs> but um, I hear it all the time, you know, you never did that. But, um, but now it consists, we have about 85 customers that order every day for the next day. So I walk around with the list of the customers on a clipboard. It's tied to me. It's why we don't go anywhere. Um, but it's tied to me, and now, thankfully, with technology, they just text me their order, so then I could just confirm it right back. Yep, we have that. We'll see you tomorrow, that kind of thing, because everybody orders again today for the next day. Some of the orders have to be in by 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and then some of the others have until 5 o'clock in the afternoon to get their orders in. At that time, I have to go through and see what has been ordered and then figure out what the best way is to get it there. We have four rider trucks, box trucks that we lease, and um, they go up north to Pennsylvania and Wilmington and all of that. And then we have a truck that goes down to the beach route and goes in the beach area, and then one goes over east and over to the Maryland side of things. My point is, until all of the orders are in, or until I have all of the information, I can't do the logistics of what the deliveries are gonna look like the next day. I really can't do anything ahead of time. I really can't do anything before 5 o'clock when all of the orders are in, when I can see what makes sense to put on truck number one, truck number two, truck number three. And it's never the same because not all customers order today for the next day. So it changes. It changes daily. You would think that, you know, it would be kind of routine. And for the most part, it's fairly routine. But somebody who only gets two bins of something might want six one day, and then that bumps somebody because the truck will only hold so much, 24 bins. Um, so my point to the logistics of our shield is you have to have all the information before you can make a decision. Again, we can't go on our feelings. I can't say, oh, I don't think so-and-so is going to order today, so let's just go ahead and do all the paperwork and get all this ready to send it out because nine times out of ten, something's going to come in, something's going to change, and I've wasted time, I've been distracted by something, and I have to go back and redo it. And we just kind of have to pay attention. We have to recognize the enemy. We have to recognize when fear or anxiety or division or false lies or false information comes our way. We just have to be aware. We can't be walking through this day half asleep 
thinking that it's going to be a routine day because we know at any time something can happen to throw us out of the routine. And that's on us if we're being lazy or if we're falling asleep at the wheel. That's, you can't blame someone else for those problems. Your faith, your faith didn't, you didn't take up your shield of faith that day. You didn't put on your shoes that day. We have to be responsible for ourselves and our walk with the Lord. The D for shield, um, the division, not divisive, not um, division as in a separation, but the division, this, this um, pod, like we were talking about in the Roman army, this division, um, our community, our church, teen challenge as a group. You guys have each other's backs. Um, I don't know if you all have seen the movie Gridiron. Anybody seen that with The Rock? It was old. It was like 2005. Yeah, I watched it last night. It was good. It was good. Um, Gary, my husband, he wanted to watch it, and he fell asleep before it even started. So I watched the whole thing. Um, but it was really kind of cool how, you know, there were gangs. In, in These were young juvenile delinquents, and there were gangs in there, and these two just couldn't seem to get past it. The um, preface of the movie was The Rock was going to have them play football, give them something to get out all their anxiety and their anger, and also work as a unit together. And um, these two guys, it took them like half the movie to finally get it together and, um, you know, protect each other out on the field. And, um, you know, so that's our shield, our strategic homeland intervention, enforcement, logistics, division. Now I'm going to go to um, 2 Timothy 2, 1 to 13. Probably going to run out of breath while I read it. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, Anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crop. Reflect on what I am saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel, for which I am suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Here is a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. God cannot go back on his own mercy and his compassion. And I thought that that was pretty awesome that um, when we have little faith, when, when we are faithless, God still remains faithful. If we, if we um, disown him, he will disown us. It was kind of a tit for tat all the way through there until that one. It says if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Your level of faith will always be tied to your perception of God. How big do you think your God is? You don't have to have a larger faith. God does not require a larger faith to move. He knows where your faith is rooted. He does not require that. But what is your perception of God? Is your faith rooted in a good God? If you get to know him, like if we got to know the chair that we're looking at. Obviously, if we brought up a chair from God Squad, the little tiny chair, it wouldn't hold many of us at all. We would have to look at it. We would have to understand the strength of the chair. We would have to um, probably wouldn't have faith that that chair was going to hold us. But, um, you know, you have to have your perception. What is your perception of, of your God? And again, there's no better way to get a better perception than to find a community, to find a church, to be in his word, most importantly. We cannot go by our feelings. They change hourly. 
they do change hourly. It's not just women. We know. It's men, too. We're <laughs> there aren't many women in here, but I can say. I know it. I know what y'all are saying. I know what you're thinking. <laughs> but, it's, but it's very true. It is very true. But we cannot go by our feelings because they change hourly. They are persuaded easily. They are distracted. We don't have to have a large faith, but we need to be rooted in a good God. God is faithful. He will never be any less faithful to me in my times of little faith. And then I just wanted to um, get that on the screen. I'm going to close with this. I don't even know what time it is. But. Hebrews chapter 10, um, verses 19 to 25. And I looked, um, well, when we read out of Timothy, Timothy wrote the book of Timothy. Timothy was like a son to Paul. He kind of took him under his wing. He was, Paul was like his spiritual father. Um, they say they don't really know who might have written the book of Hebrews. Many, many theories, but. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. What I would like to do is have um, different people read these verses, but I just wanted to read this out of this Bible study first. <clears throat> to be clear, some of the issues we face in life requires no need for personal revelation. God has already made himself perfectly clear on many things in his unchanging word. But when we're seeking clarity on the finer details of our personal lives, on whether or not, like Simon, to launch out into deep waters, God's spirit will convict us. He will guide and lead us. He may do it with biblical principles or perhaps through the confirmation, like we had said, of godly counsel or churches or in our prayer time or... So as believers, we have the privilege of knowing his direction for us as we prayerfully seek it. Um, when we read about the armor of God, when they talk about the six pieces of the armor, he finishes that up and he says, pray. Pray for one another. Pray without ceasing. That is the biggest, that is the biggest thing. Again, all of them are important and all of them need to be put on together. We're not perfect people. We're not going to do it every day. But if we continue to seek God's word, he continues to make us mindful of, of what he would have us do. And the more that we begin to focus and direct our eyes on him and not get distracted by the javelins that are being thrown at us by the enemy, um, then we're able to advance that much more. Some days are going to be a setback. Some days are going to be a standstill. And some days you're going to advance. You're going to be on the offensive line and you're working towards the day when the Lord comes back and says, welcome home, my good and faithful servant. Amen. So is there, um, they did this downstairs. It always made me uncomfortable, so I thought I'd bring it up here. <laughs> is there a <laughs> someone who would want to read the first one, Deuteronomy 31.6? Thank you. And I will say that these scriptures here are the ones where God has made it clear to us. You can take this with you, and there are, you'll see there are things, questions where you don't really have to wonder where God stands on things. He's already told you in his word. He's made it very clear. Um, next, Philippians 4, 6. Oops. 
So when we're worried, what are we supposed to do? He tells us, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. We can't stand and turn in a circle and say, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do. He's told you what to do. You have it. You have it here. And anyone here tonight or in church on Sunday mornings or any other time when you're under the word of God, you can no longer claim that you didn't know. Once you know, then God holds you responsible for acting on that. Uh, Romans 13, 1 to 2. All right. Right. Again, because I said so. Right. Any authority, any person in authority, that's all they really have to say. Is, well, why do we have to go to bed at 10 o'clock? Because I said so. That's it. Second uh, Corinthians 614. We just have a few to go. Yes. Thanks. Amen. So this verse gets quoted a lot um, for relationships between men and women. I absolutely know that. I, my husband is not a Christian, and I absolutely know that being yoked together when a, with an unbeliever is not an easy thing. It's, it's a distraction, but the devil is predictable. So I've got his number after 30 years of marriage. I, I got that. <laughs> But it's not just for that. It yoked is not even necessarily just about a marriage. It's used a lot in that context. But don't be fooled and don't be deceived. It could be your friends or your posse or the people you hang around with. Don't be yoked together. <laughs> Do people say that anymore? Um, <laughs> Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. You don't have things in common with them anymore. So you need to seek the light. Ephesians 4.29 Kind of speaks for itself, huh? That it may benefit those who listen. There's no need to tear somebody down. You feel terrible after you do it. They feel terrible after you do it. And then it just is going to have to come down to the next one. Somebody's going to have to forgive. <laughs> Second Corinthians two five to seven. Poppy, can you read? That's a tough one. But because he said so, we have to forgive. Because he said so. Malachi 3.10. Pastor Tim. I didn't realize it was that one <laughs> that I was asking you to read. He, he tells us all the time, don't forget your ties. Don't forget your ties. <laughs> that just worked out perfect. <laughs> you probably didn't even need to look at that, did you? You know what it was. Um, the whole tithe, you know, and, and, and God directs you in that as well. Don't just hold it back at 10%. If he tells you to give more, you give more. If he tells you give here, here, and here, you know, God directs you. He's not. He's not up there manipulating us like we are little minions and saying, I want you to go here and I want you to go. He has a purpose and a will for your lives. Yes, sir.
That's right. No, that's exactly right. Yeah, that's right. And it it's a blessing in many ways. It might not be a monetary blessing. It might be a blessing with a, a beautiful wife and a beautiful family or a beautiful church or you're you're now singing or you've always wanted to play the guitar and you're playing the guitar. Um, you know, God God has a purpose and he's going to fulfill his purpose in you some way, somehow. He's going to change the circumstances and get you in line with where he wants you to be. 1 Corinthians six eighteen. I know um, in a youth group, it's being a teenager in a youth group, we heard this one a lot. They, they talked about it a lot. But I'll never forget the, the analogy of, you know, the, the holy, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And why, and, and we can take this with anything, whether it's sexual immorality or addiction, um, young girls doing the cutting Things we watch, things we hear, just anything. Just, just imagine Jesus sitting right there with you. Do you really, do you really want that? Uh, you, you really just don't want. That. It makes you cringe. It's a cringe-worthy thought. And again, he says it. He says it. There's no question about it. It's what he says. It's what he means. And then I'll read the last one. Hebrews 10:25. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. And I've heard this verse a lot, um, a lot. But I don't think I've ever, like, paid attention to the part that says, as some are in the habit of doing. But I have heard many sermons. I'm pretty sure Pastor Tim has preached on that as well. It, it takes a lot sometimes to get out of bed and go to church. It takes a lot sometimes to get up and go to Bible study, to um, to do something. But God will always bless you in it. And um, giving up meeting together, you're just putting yourselves out in that battlefield behind your own shield, which is only two feet by four feet wide. You might be able to crouch behind it, but it's not going to be long before something's going to come from the left or the right or overhead unless you're linked together and you get to have that turtle shell formation and you get to stand back to back with your brothers and your sisters when you need them, they're going to be there for you. So I thought that that was a great one to end on. I just want to make a comment, but I, I want to ask Jackie again to um, give me the quote about how faith and your perception of God. Tell me exactly what that was. Your level of faith will always be tied to your perception of God. I think that's so important um, to ask ourselves the question, what is our perception of God? And when you, you know, and I think as we go in Christ, as we get to know him, our, our, our perception of him changes. I think all of us, um, that probably stems from our childhood, we formed a, a concept or a picture of God, of who he was. But that's not necessarily who God is. I, I can tell you for me personally, when I thought of God as a child, I thought of this majestic being uh, sitting on a throne, but I, I saw him in the distance. I, so I didn't, I didn't doubt his ability or his power or his authority. But my perception was, that he was there, he's watching everything, he's taking care of everything. I didn't see him as a as a God that was personal, though. 
And it wasn't until I really tapped into a relationship with God that, that I allowed my perception of who God is. And I think that that was really, that was really um, powerful tonight when I thought of that, that, that our faith is linked with our perception of God. And so I just want to ask you that question and leave you with this thought. How do we perceive God? Because how you perceive him will determine how far you can go in him, your, your, that ability with faith. Amen. Thank you, Jack. You look good tonight. Awesome word. All right. So again, tomorrow, uh, next week we will be uh, we'll be underneath the big tent there, right in front of Crossroads Church, and uh, so we won't have any any anything here next Wednesday night. But we'll be there. It starts at seven. So I uh, hope that everybody will come and be a part and uh, experience and see what God is uh, doing in this countywide crusade. We pray for God's uh, outpouring and uh, and a good time of ministry that will take place. Let's just take a moment, bow our heads, pray, and ask God to take this word, shield of faith, and uh, to let it ignite our faith. Lord, thank you for your word, the truth of it, God, how it impacts us, how it changes us, and how it speaks truth to us. Lord, we thank you for uh, what Jackie has shared tonight on the shield of faith. Pray, Lord, that as we go from this place, that we, we walk in faith, not in our own strength, not in our own knowledge, but, Lord, in the strength of who you are by your word and what you've already done. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.